communion and in tune with the Holy Spirit, the more the Holy Spirit can make us aware at times when he desires to. And that's a gift, an infused gift called the discernment of spirits as St. Paul talks about in that list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he says there's the gift of prophecy to build up the body of Christ, there's the gift of healing, there's the gift of, uh, does he say casting out demons is one of the gifts there? I think that's just mentioned somewhere else. He says there's the gift of discernment of spirits, there's the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues and administration, all that stuff. And so it's an inf in a true infused gift, but it's also a gift that can be acquired by proper formation of our conscience, by proper formation of faith and morals, by a solid formation in the teachings of the church and the sacred tradition that comes from the greatest of the saints that lucidly explain the faith based on revelation and, and refined reason. And so we can begin to acquire that that, and that begins to um, be more refined through the gift of counsel and the gift of prudence. So it can be acquired, but it's very important because there's so much goofy stuff going on. And, 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 and since the, re the revolution of the late 60s in the church, there's been a whole lot of goofy stuff going on. Liturgically and morally and priestly and seminarianly and all, all over the place in the church has been some crazy stuff going on. And it all has its, it's all fueled by a particular philosophy. We have to be able to know how to discern what's coming from God versus what's coming from the spirit of the world and the spirit of the flesh and the spirit of Satan. The word spirit in this context signifies a special way of judging, loving, willing, or acting. Spirit here, when we speak of the discernment of spirits, it refers to a mental attitude or an inclination. Okay, What makes a person tick? The attitude, the inclination of how we judge, how we love, how we will, how we act, how we see things. What um, Filters do we have in our worldview? How do we process? How, what's our world vision? How do we understand and process um, our purpose? In the spiritual life, we have to distinguish between primarily three kinds of spirits, and we know that as the spirit of God, the spirit of the devil, and the spirit of human nature. Human nature is the most common one. We're usually living and operating and influenced by things that are solely on the human level. It's very common, of course, and thanks be to God, it's just very normal and ordinary things. But the human visible world is completely interrelated and penetrated with the spiritual world. The two go hand in hand, they're intermixed, and they're usually a mixture of, of, of both. So it, usually it's not just, this is just all you know, evil, or this is just all the Holy Spirit, or this is just all this, or this is just all that. It's not always black and white. There's usually a mixture of things going on. Even, yeah, there's in many respects, there's always a mixture. The Spirit of God is an internal prompting or tendency of the soul to judge, love, will, and act in what's called a supernatural way. Now, when we say supernatural in, in, as Christians and in, the, in this theological context, we don't mean it any way like you would see the TV show on A&E, The Supernatural. <laughs> right? It's not spacey, esoteric, ghost-chasing, supernatural. It's supernatural in the sense of what is above nature, namely the nature of God, God elevating our dignity. God elevating uh, our orientation in the sense of our motivation and our desires to a higher level of living and a greater quality of life. Super means above. So God is lifting us up rather than just being earthbound. The spirit of human nature, this is where things get so interesting. And you, when you read these theologians, man, and these great teachers, you know, and they're writing, this is, this is, by the way, taken from Father Garigou Lagrange, a great Dominican um, teacher. 
he was really a, a, just a, quite a genius, really. And he's writing from a Thomistic tradition, and, and this source here was published in 1951, and yet everything of what he says applies so much for the stuff that we're still faced with. Because though the external circumstances and trappings and accidentals may change, human nature doesn't change. And, and the stuff that we come up against, in its essence, doesn't change. Its name might be different, the shape it takes might be different, but what the, what's behind it is usually going to be the same. The spirit of human nature is characterized as an inclination, again, to judge, to will, and to act in, ex in an excessively human manner, following the lead of fallen nature, which tends towards what? Sin, right? Um, but even more mildly, before getting into the realm of sin, our human nature left to itself tends towards its own ease and advantage. The road of least resistance. As in the pursuit of happiness, the road of least resistance. Pleasure. Immediate gratification. The quick fix. So human nature left to itself on many levels is inclined towards the spirit of egotism and the spirit of individualism. Me, myself, and I. Almighty me. The sovereign self. Autonomous from everything and everyone. Even independent and in no need of God. I am sufficient of myself. That's human nature left to itself at its worst when, it, when pride becomes fully inflated like it did in the enemy. The, the, the fallen angel. We see this spirit of humanity which can lead so much to this false prudence. We see this spirit of the human nature that leads to this false prudence where did any place come out, just anything that comes to mind from the Gospels? St. Peter, right after he realizes Jesus, his identity, and he doesn't see him on the human level, because human nature, in trying to wrap your mind around the person of Jesus of Nazareth, what do we say? Well, you know, I, who do you say that I am? Well, you know, some people say the prophets, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Elijah, we can't figure you out. We know that you, you bad. We know that you're bad. I mean, you're one of the great ones, but we still don't know who you are. So you're, in other words, you're just a wise man, a great teacher, a religious figure, a great hero, but they still didn't get it. Because all those things were very nice. And they may have thought it was kind of a compliment, but it still fall, fell very short of the truth. Because there's a big difference between being a godly man in comparison to being God-made man and Emmanuel. It's a huge difference. The world in world history has had plenty of godly men with different religions. But here, Brassar, my friend, we're talking about God-made man. Emmanuel, God with us. And so then St. Peter receives the illumination. He receives a revelation, the spirit of prophecy. He has an infused understanding of God without putting it there himself by a gift that God imparted and implanted in him. He has this aha epiphany moment and says, oh my gosh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus, aha. Uh -huh. What did he say after that? Yeah, yeah, that's true. He said that, but flesh and blood didn't tell you this. The spirit of human nature didn't tell you this. My heavenly father told you that. St. Paul says, and all, we can only say Jesus Christ is Lord, how? By the Holy Spirit. In other words, what that means is, yeah, anybody, anybody off the road, you know, any Joe Blow off the street, and you say, hey, say this passage right here, Jesus is Lord. Anybody could do that. But what St. Paul is saying is to say it from the gut like you mean it, that confession of faith, Jesus, my Lord and my God, like St. Thomas, you are real. Oh, my God. And really mean it, not say it in vain. Like, oh, my God. Like, oh, my God. Wow. 
Only the Holy Spirit can awaken us to that. So flesh and blood didn't teach him that. The Holy Spirit did. And no sooner did, did St. Peter get that gift that a couple of verses later, at probably a few moments later, what happens? The hum, spirit of human nature takes over again. Remember? Because Jesus says, okay, now you know my identity. This is going to be controversial, buddy. The hour is right around the corner. People aren't going to understand it. They're not going to like it. They're not going to accept it. The cross is my destiny. Are you with me or for me or against me? And he says, guess what? You know, now that you know who I am, get ready because you're going to go down with me. And, and St. Peter couldn't figure that out. He said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is good news. I mean, you're the Christ. The cross can't possibly be part of the picture. And he's tried giving Jesus some advice as if he knew better. No, 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 you, gotta, you, you must have got this part wrong, Lord. Let me just, you know, let me just fill you in. I mean, that, that, that can't be right, right? I mean, you got, you got the script wrong, right? It's like, no, mm, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You were thinking like human beings think, not as God. And as a result, by thinking according to that human nature with that false prudence, the enemy came in and tried separating Jesus from the will of God. So we see those, that spirit working there in scripture very specifically. So let's look at the specifics on, on how that takes place because prudence, according to the spirit of human nature, it's not, prudence is not what it's meant to be. It's not treated as the, a virtue directing a person's actions toward what is morally good and even morally perfect. Like, what I see by morally perfect, let me just put it in scriptural terms because this is kind of Thomistic terms. Remember that beautiful passage, Romans 12, chapter 1, verse two, through verse 2. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may know what is God's will, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good, pleasing, and perfect is God's will. In other words, there's many dimensions to God's will. There's things that are good, there's good things that are pleasing, there's things that are perfect. In other words, there's good, better, and best. You want to choose that? Okay, that's pretty good. But if you chose that, that would be even better. If you chose that one, let's see, that's the best. So there's different degrees of how we can respond to God's will. There's a lot of things that are neutrally good, but there's things that are even better in regards to truly seeking what is most perfect. And so prudence is that particular virtue in, that is meant to direct our actions toward what is morally perfect and good, and therefore it, it orders the other virtues. But prudence, according to the spirit of human nature, it's the virtue needed for finding means of avoiding every inconvenience. Avoiding every inconvenience is the motivation for prudence according to human nature. So similarly, this hopefully starts to make sense as we continue to go along. It'll fill in the blanks, I hope. Similarly, mediocrity in the spirit of human nature takes the place of the happy medium of virtue. Let me see if we got this. Because in living a life of virtue, we have to seek a balanced life, right? No extremes too far to the right or too far to the left. If we're too liberal or we're too conservative, we might not be balanced. We got to be in the middle, the medium, in every aspect of virtue. And that's a, that's a godly thing, balance. But mediocrity twists that medium to something that is different. The spirit of mediocrity, it steers a middle course between good and evil, but it does so not through any love of virtue, but purely for utilitarian reasons. To, in order to avoid the disadvantages resulting from the practice of virtue. In other words, it will do whatever is convenient in order to avoid um, anything that would challenge itself, anything that would challenge its comfort. But on the other hand, the happy medium of virtue presents the highest central point 
between two extreme vices. For example, what is the happy, the medium, the, the balance in respect to the virtue of courage? It's the golden mean between cowardice, one extreme, and rash daring on the other. So both are vices, to be cowardly or to be so rambunctiously spontaneous and impulsive as to have rash daring in the name of God. Remember the enemy tempted Jesus and says, if you are the son of God, jump off this cliff to prove. That's not courage, it's a rash daring that's a vice, not a virtue. But the virtue of courage is in the middle. And courage, by the way, really important to spell out for us, doesn't simply mean that, like all of the virtues, especially love, to be courageous or to be loving doesn't mean we have to have the corresponding feeling. Because whether, let's look at the martyrs. If a person was called to give up their life for Christ in hostile circumstances and in an environment where religious freedom was severed, if that person is called to give their life for Christ, they might go up to their death filled with all types of conflicting feelings, filled with maybe a lot of concerns and anxieties. But nevertheless, despite their feelings, they put their life on the line and they marched forward in giving their lives for the Lord and not rejecting and denying their faith. Even though they didn't feel bravado, even though it wasn't like a romantic story in Butler's Lives of the Saints, nevertheless, they chose and did the right thing. And that choice is the mark between, is the mark of true courage, not the feeling. So too in the practice of virtue, when we're called to do something that is good and right and beautiful for God, especially in terms of when helping someone else, even if we don't feel like it, but we do it willingly because it's the right thing to do. That's what makes the difference that we're putting our will into it, and eventually the feelings can accompany it, but they're secondary, not primary. The spirit of mediocrity, here's where it invades even the theological virtues, and this is really important in respect to what I was challenging us on yesterday in regards to a resurrection faith, a hope-filled expectation to take the limits off of God and to broaden our heart's horizon on what is possible for the Lord to do in our lives based on Him, not on us, based on His merits and His power to accomplish, based on His benevolence and goodness, that the more confidence we have in God, the more we honor Him. It's not through presumption, because our trust is placed in His mercy with contrition, but the more we hope, the more we receive, because the more we widen our heart. And so this resurrection faith of taking the limits off of God and not limiting him by our, our kind of pusillanimous, our, our small-mindedness, we don't limit him by um, the way we think about him based on our own personal experience. We don't limit our destiny to what we've experienced in our history, but we open wide the door to new possibility. This is where we cast out the spirit of mediocrity because the spirit of mediocrity, it tries to invade the theological virtues by continually denying further possible development to full perfection. And, and remember, perfection means mature, maturation, completion. As if the theological virtues were bound by their nature to be nothing more than average virtues. As though it were possible for man to err by excess in his belief or hope in God, or in his love for God. Just as a man might love his country to excess by placing it before God. In other words, you can't be too much on fire in love with God. Even if your family thinks you're a fanatic or a freak. What makes the difference is how you relate the fire of God's love. Hopefully the fire of your love, of God's love, is making your love more genuine, more even attractive in regards to drawing people to Jesus. 
the more that God's fire of love is enhancing your human qualities. The fire of God's love is refining the aspects of your personality and not making you very eccentric. Hence, if, if people dismiss that fire of love when it's balanced like that, if they dismiss it as being fanatical, then that, the falsehood is on them, not on you. Because there's a difference between being a fanatic and being on fire. Being fervent versus, um, what was the distinction? A distinction came to me the other day. Being a zealous for the Lord versus being a zealot, a fanatic. You know, I mean, like, like those guys that, oh, God bless them, you know, but, oh, they really get on my nerves, quite honestly. That they, they like, the other day, I was going to the Carmelite nuns in Santa Clara, and on Santana Row, there was this dude there with a big sign, believe in Christ or burn. <laughs> Hello, even, I mean, I was, if I wasn't a Christian, like before when I wasn't a Christian, that definitely wouldn't attract me to Christ and to Christianity. It would draw me further away. And now that I am a Christian, thanks be to God by his grace, you're giving us a bad name, bro. Put the sign away. My goodness. And then they had the blowhorn, and I mean, just, Jesus is coming, repent, repent. And he has his Bible in his hand. It's like, my goodness, I don't belong to that guy. I don't belong to that crowd. I mean, now that's the kind of fanatic that gives Christianity a bad name. I'm sorry. I mean, that's how I'm taking it. I apologize if I'm being arrogant. But for me, it just rubs against my grain. It just rubs against my grain. And so when your family sees you being on fire, then they might associate that you with them. And you're like, well, you're just a fanatic. Stop talking to me about religion. Blah, blah, blah. You're always preaching to me. I used to tell my mom that. Stop preaching to me. I'm stop, stop preaching to me. I used to always tell that to my mom, go figure what happened next. <laughs> the spirit of human nature will always be found to result in tepidity and eventually in sloth. And the person who yields to its promptings commits numerous venial sins which gradually become more and more deliberate until at last he falls into mortal sin. So let's look at the pattern here. We've got the spirit of mediocrity, which breeds slothfulness, a lukewarm spirit, being wishy-washy about the faith, you know, loosey-goosey about values and moral, moral life and things like this. And eventually that sloth will lead to a leniency, an excessive leniency towards venile sins. You just become more and more open. Oh, it's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. It's no big deal, you know, there's this, there's that, and, and we start to, little by little, oh, come on, it's just a joke. Oh, stop, why do you have to be so serious? It's just a joke, lighten up. <laughs> come on, it's kind of a raunchy joke, dude. I mean, there's no class in it, I mean, come on, I mean, there's, there's no taste in that. And, and, and you just start, little by little, you know, it starts to become open to those things until it eventually actually becomes sin, right? There's that saying that is, um, used in different circles, and I've used it plenty of times myself, if we don't guard our thoughts, our thoughts become our words. If we don't guard our words, our words become our actions. And our actions become our character, or our habit before that, and our character becomes our destiny. And it all begins with the guarding of our thoughts. And our words, oh, there's a lot to say about words because words have power. We're made in the image and likeness of the divine word. And when God spoke his word, there came to be light. And when we say our words, our words have power to either build up or to break down, to give life or death, as the book of Proverbs says. Our words have power to manifest realities, what they signify. So you can, you can have gone, been in a car accident or have hurt you know, fallen off your bike and broke this bone or that bone, and eventually it heals, it's fine, but there's some things that people can say to you that you never forget. Those words, power and words. They leave a mark. So we, in our words, if we're loose with our words and our language, our vocabulary, uh, the lifestyle is just around the corner. Right, right there. 
thing. It's at, it's, at, it's at hand. It's not the kingdom of God. It's another kingdom is at hand. The spirit of human nature gives man an earthbound vision of everything, even of divine things. Oh, man. Why do I think that's good? Oh, man. That's good, even of divine things. See, people, if they if they're, have a worldly spirit, or a spirit that is just purely, just so saturated in just a human spirit, and you, and you associate that human way of looking at everything that's not enlightened by faith and, re, and revelation, and you look at this just human spirit as being wisdom, as being um, you know, in step and with it. As Archbishop Sheen said, with it. I always hear these priests saying, with it. With what? Is it the Holy Spirit? Archbishop Sheen was a prophet. And so when, we're, when we have this worldly spirit or this excessively human spirit, even the divine things of Christianity, which is a supernatural divine revelation of God, gets muddled down to the base ordinary level. And you exude it and you strip it of all supernatural transcendent mystery and majesty and sacredness and it just becomes a social corporation. Social corporation. And that's why Pope Francis says, you priests are not called to be CIO, CEOs. You're called to be men of God, other Christs. And that spirit of the world creeps in. That spirit of Vatican II creeps in. Which is not the Vatican documents. It's a whole other spirit. And then people start tearing up the church in the name of the spirit. And taking out all the beautiful things and putting in ugly things and saying this is modern art and fashionable and it's ugly. You just strip the sacred tradition by this wishy-washy philosophy that is not inspired by Jesus Christ, bro. And if you stand up to it, and I mean, this stuff was going on big time in the seminaries. Oh my goodness. I... Got, I I was a blank slate when I came to the faith, and Jesus, I mean, thanks be to God, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. I didn't know any priest growing up. The only priest I saw, I saw from a distance, and they did their thing, and I did mine. Thank you very much. But I was never inspired to be a priest. And, but when I came to the faith, I mean, I didn't know squat. And so when I came and I started finding out, you know, what, all this drama going on in seminaries and this and that and blah, blah, blah. It's like, my gosh, Lord, what's going on with your church? You need to clean up the mess. <laughs> I mean, Lord, you want me to give up a family and a wife for this? Come on. You better always be something good in it for me. <laughs> and I mean, the, 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 wow, some of these older friars who have been around for some years. I mean, I, I, I mean, the Lord has just protected me and preserved me in our province. Thanks be to God, our province of the Carmelites. We are blessed. We are blessed. We're blessed. We didn't have any of this drama. I, we don't got none of this drama. You start hearing about some other war story that's like, oh, my gosh, keep me away from that. Oh, goodness gracious. The spirit of human nature. And that's why we didn't, and then you get messed up homilies where people will talk about, the, everything gets dubbed down. Oh, there's not really, when Jesus was casting out demons, it's not really demons. They just really had a mental illness. <laughs> there really isn't such a thing as demons. I mean, we gotta really get beyond all that. <laughs> or the multiplication of the 5,000 loaves. Eh, there's not really a multiplication of 5,000. They really actually were just sharing a meal. That's the miracle. And Noah's Ark, the parting of the Red Sea, or, well, you know, the resurrection. <laughs> I mean, where does it end? You just start to unravel the whole thing. Where does it end? You end up losing your faith. You have no faith. It's all interconnected. You start messing with one thing, it's all going to come apart. We've been hit. The guy's putting this back together.